But more seriously, because I come with a very serious question to my assistant. Her name is Siri. <laughs> so one day, I, I said, hey Siri, what's the meaning of life? And Siri's immediate reply is, I'm surprised you asked this question of an inanimate object. But I wouldn't give up, so I asked again, hey Siri, what's the meaning of life? And this is what Siri replied, life. The condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change uh, reaching death. So it gave me a dictionary definition of life, but failed to tell me the meaning of it. So I asked one more time, hey Siri, what's the meaning of life? And the answer this time is to think more about questions like this. So the meaning of life is to think about the meaning of life. So I ask one more time, Hey Siri, what's the meaning of life? And this time Siri says in three words, I give up. <laughs> but I didn't give up. So I ask one last time, Hey Siri, what's the meaning of life? And then I got my answer. This is what Siri says, All evidence to date suggests it's chocolate. So I got my meaning of life. Meaning of life is chocolate. You see, in the same way that Siri is unable to answer the question of the meaning of life, the philosophies and wisdom of humanity fails to address and answer this question adequately. What's the meaning of life? Because we are unable to understand ultimate reality, ultimate truth and ultimate meaning apart from the Word of God. And when we come to the Word, we come to touch ultimate reality and from ultimate reality, understand this ultimate truth and from ultimate truth, thereby derive ultimate meaning. And these three, reality, truth and meaning, is found at the cross of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to share with you concerning the cross of Jesus. The reason for that is the defining anchor of Christianity, the very center of gravity for Christianity is the cross of Jesus Christ. And we have made a very subtle shift in Christian discipleship. We have moved from a cross-centered Christianity to a cause-centered Christianity, C-A-U-S-E. We champion the cause. There is a battle to be fought. We must marshal the troops. The flag and the banner must be raised high. There is a cause. Yes, there is. But the centre of Christianity is not the cause. It is the cross that gives meaning to the cause. We cannot shift from that very centre. We cannot shift from that very mooring, that very anchor, that theological root that gives ultimate reality, truth and meaning to the whole of human existence and to the very centre of Christianity and discipleship, the cross of Jesus. And this afternoon, I want to share with you a very simple message on the three ironies of the cross. Would you bow with me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless this time? Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you now to ask you to open our eyes to the cross of Jesus. That in this most unlikely place, because it's a place of execution and death, we find meaning. Because in the cross, we find truth and reality. So help us, dear Father, help us to come back to embrace the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, but for us, it defines the very meaning of Christianity. Help us, Lord, in this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. And the first irony of the cross is that he who was crucified as king is indeed king. He who was crucified as king, he is indeed king. In Matthew chapter 27, we read in verse 29, first of all, And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They mocked him. 
Hail, King of the Jews. The irony was he was indeed king. And they have completely missed it. Chapter 27, verse 37. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Written in three languages, King of the Jews. You know, in the ancient days, you know that a cross is a Roman uh, method of execution. And in the ancient days, this is what you find. That at the cross on top, there is a charge sheet, as it were. The crime that was committed. So it could be robber, murderer, rapist. To give the reason, the crime committed, why this man is crucified. And on Jesus' cross, they were the words, the King of the Jews, the King of the Jews, the King of the Jews, in three languages, in Latin, Aramaic, and Greek, King of the Jews. What an irony. He was King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Lord of Kings, and the King of Lords, and they miss him entirely. He came unto his own, his own receive him not. Now when John 1, 12 says that, or John 1, 11, he came to his own, his own receive him not. The, the pronoun is in two verbal forms, two gender. One is neuter, uh, the other is masculine. In other words, he came to his own place. He came to his own domain. He came to his own kingdom. And his own people receive him not. Verse 12, but as many as receive him, to them give them power. To, him, to them he gave power to become sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. Children of God. He was king. He is king. And they missed him. Central to the very core of Christianity is the question, who is Jesus? On a flight one day, I encountered a professor of history um, in, in London. And we were talking about Jesus. And he made the statement that Jesus is not a historical figure that there is an academic uh, persuasion, a wrong persuasion, but there's an academic persuasion of the quest of the historic Jesus, who the historic Jesus really is, and his opinion is there's no such person as Jesus. And I ask the Lord for wisdom. Why? Because there are many ways to refute this. I could quote Josephus, the Jewish historian, or Pini, or evidences of the New Testament documents, all point to the existence of Jesus. But somewhere down the line, I wanted something that would connect. So I asked the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom. I, I don't want to just enter into an uh, apologetic discussion, a historical discussion. Help me to say something that would connect with this history professor. And then the Holy Spirit laid something upon my heart so simple. I actually did a double take. I was like, but this is a professor of history. And the answer is so simple that was given. Should, should I even give to him? Because the answer is, if there's no Jesus of Nazareth, how do we get B.C. and A.D.? Before Christ and, and Anno Domini, the, the after Christ, how do we get that? Jesus came and divided history. I shared that with him and his reply was, I've never considered that before. You're right. And I went like, whoa, it's so simple. You see, in the world we live in, there is no A-S-B-S, B-S-A-S, before Spider-Man, after Spider-Man. We don't have. It's before Christ and after Christ, the life that divided history. Who is Jesus? In the 1983 Gallup poll, there was a question asked of Americans, who do you think Jesus is? 70% says he's not just another man. But 42% says uh, he may be God among men. 27% say Jesus was only human. 9% says Jesus embodied the best of humanity, but he is not God. But they agreed, yeah, he, he embodied the best of humanity. C.S. Lewis say, please, please don't come up with such patronizing nonsense to say Jesus is a good man. Because Jesus claimed to be God, and if he claims to be God, there are only two, three possibilities. Either he's a liar, he knew he's false to claim to be God, that he's not, and yet he claimed to be God, he's a liar. Or he is insane, he's a lunatic. 
He claimed to be God, but he wasn't God. He thought he was. He was insane. If he's not liar, if he's not lunatic, he's Lord. Who do you think Jesus is? This is the most important question for humanity. Jesus asked of his disciples, who do you think that I am? And the irony of the cross is that they mocked him as king when he was in fact indeed king. And they crucified him king of the Jews. The important question we have to ask in discipleship is who's the boss in our life? Because just as they crucified Christ as king in mockery, and miss the reality in the church today, we have to ask that question, who's the boss in your life? Because this issue of lordship, this issue of kingship, this issue of who's boss in your life defines who you are as a Christian and determines your discipleship. Who really calls the shot? Who really directs your life? Who really tells you what to do? I am a pastor for 30 years. And as a pastor for 30 years, I am not the boss. Having been a senior pastor for 25 years and then the leadership mentor for the last five years, I don't walk around feeling, hey, I'm a servant of the Lord. I call my own shots. My time is at my own discretion. I am the boss. I am not. Because there is a king that I serve. His name is Jesus. And so I come to Jesus and say, Lord, you are the king. You direct me. I will follow you, your directions, wherever you call me to go. So the reason why I'm here three times that this year, I mean three messages and so on, is because of divine appointments. I believe in the Lord's leading. He guides. And at the IDMC conference, I said, even the typhoon, T10 typhoon, Hector in Hong Kong, could not stop the flight coming over to Sydney. Why? Because there is a divine appointment and Jesus is Lord. The airport tells us, cannot, no flight flying out. Hong Kong tells us everything shuts down, hundreds of flights cancel. But I say to M, pack our bags, we are going to the airport, even though the, uh, the airport Sorry, the airlines tell us that no flights are going in and out. Pack your bags, we are stepping out in faith. Why? Because I believe Jesus is king. If he calls me, he will make the way. One of the strangest calls I get was one day, a few years ago, the Lord spoke to me. Son, I'm sending you to the Chinese-speaking church. Now, to my embarrassment, I don't speak Chinese. I cannot speak in Chinese. I am Chinese, but my ministry is mainly in the English-speaking world. I, I, I don't know how to preach in Chinese. But the Lord told me very specifically, Son, I'm sending you to the Chinese-speaking world. I didn't argue with God. As far as I'm concerned, He's king. I have only two problems. I told the Lord, number one, I don't speak Chinese. I don't know how it's possible. I will follow your leading. Secondly, my schedule is, is booked solid three years in advance. Uh, about two years ago, there was already an invitation for 2022. Am I correct? 2022. So with a block chalk calendar, I, 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 I cannot. But I dare not say I cannot to God. So I simply say, Lord, you know my schedule and you know my limitations. If you want to send me to the Chinese-speaking world, you have to open the door. I went to Hong Kong. I went to visit a grand old man. Uh, his name is Dr. Mark. He was the former principal of Singapore Bible College. I visited him in the old folks' home. I want to honour uh, an old servant of the Lord. And when I say goodbye to him, he shook my hand warmly. And this old servant of the Lord said, Pastor Chan, thank you so much for ministering to the Chinese-speaking world. He did not say the Chinese-speaking churches, the Chinese-speaking world. Exactly the same term that the Lord has told me, I'm sending you to the Chinese-speaking world. So I, I thank him very graciously. I haven't even started. I don't know how this could be possible. I received a call from Joshua Ting, uh, General Secretary of Kowei. He says, for the first time in the history of Koei, they are, they are, Koei is a gathering of all the key Chinese leaders in the Chinese-speaking world. For years, in the Koei meeting, they invited different plenary speakers, probably three or four plenary speakers. Joseph Ting was the general secretary. He called me and said, Edmund, we have made a historic decision. 
for this year, we are not having three or four plenary speakers. We only have one plenary speaker. We have decided to invite you. We'd like you to come and take all the plenary sessions and speak to us on discipleship. So the Chinese churches from Europe, from, I met someone from Rome, from Brazil, from France, uh, from all over the world, converged in Taiwan last year, right, Anne? In Taiwan last year, and the Chinese-speaking world gathered. I went like, well, thank you, Lord. I, I don't know how I could travel around the Chinese-speaking world. God gathers the Chinese-speaking world and say, you have a message of discipleship to them. I went, I went to Koei wondering who would I know in the Chinese-speaking world. But when I walk into the conference, it's as if I'm meeting old friends. I, I don't know them personally, but they came up very warmly, shook my hands, and basically what they told me is in the IDMC conference in different parts of the world, in, in, in Canada, uh, in, in Singapore, Malaysia, in, in Sydney here, there are Chinese churches that came. And they have already received warmly the message on discipleship to Jesus. And then Ken Chan, my friend, called me up and said, this year, can you come to Hong Kong for the historic Bible exposition? Ten days. I went to the Lord and said, Lord, 10 days is a long time for me. The strange thing in my calendar, the 10 days they asked for is completely blank. So I said, yes, it's the 89th Bible Exposition. It has been for 89 years now, starting in Canton. And they asked if you come to share 10 days, and I spoke to them from the book of Ecclesiastes. And this 10 days... It was broadcast to 86 stations with live audiences of 240,000 Chinese from around the world. I saw the Lord opening the door before coming here. I was in Taiwan ministering to the Taiwanese pastors. When the Lord said, I'm sending you to the Chinese-speaking world, I said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but yes, sir, he is king. He brings about things exactly as he says. Here's my question. Who's the boss in your life? Who directs your life? Who directs your ministry? David Wells, in his book, God in the Wasteland, speaks about the weightlessness of God. In other words, he says, in, in the world we live in today, uh, we live as if God doesn't matter. God is irrelevant. One author calls God, uh, uh, the, the relationship with God, with God we have is a parachute theology. Parachute theology means that we only come to God when we are in desperate need. We, we are in a free fall. We need a parachute. And therefore, we come and cry out to God. Who is God in your life? At the cross, when Jesus laid down his life, it was acknowledged by the Roman Empire He's king of the Jews. The high priests were so upset, they went to, to the governor and said, don't write this. Don't write king of the Jews. He's not king of the Jews. Instead, write this man says he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I've written, I have written king of the Jews. And you know, our Lord Jesus is not just king of the Jews. He's king of the whole world. Here's my loving question. Who is king? in your life? Who is boss? Here's the second irony of the cross. The cross was an instrument of death. But this instrument of death gives life. Look at verse 40 to verse 42. Matthew 27 verse 40 and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Verse 41. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Let him come down now. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. The cross is not just an ornament, a piece of jewelry. It is an instrument of death. But in the life of Jesus, when he sacrificed his life on the cross, the instrument of death, because the king of glory and the king of life was hung there, became the instrument of God 
for the instrument of life. What was meant as an execution point, the instrument of execution became the source of life. My daughter Amanda was three years old when mommy and her was uh, sitting in the, our bedroom at the dressing table and, and playing with different things. And then little Amanda at three years old took the cross and said, Mommy, Mommy, you got to wear this. So Mommy asked, why do you say I got to wear this? She asked just to learn what the child was thinking. And little Amanda says, Mommy, you got to wear this because people in the world must know Jesus died on the cross for them. People in the world must know Jesus died on the cross for them. Mummy wrote in the journal, I read the journal. Mummy said, when she grows up, I want to buy her a cross to remember that the world needs to know that Jesus died on the cross for them. There is life in this instrument of death. In Florence, Italy, there was this uh, very uh, talented young artist, and in those days, they are not just good in painting as artists. He's an incredible uh, sculptor. And, and he's, he put, uh, he, he half a sculpture of an angel. Because this artist was very talented, and it was a fantastic, flawless piece, he invited the great Michelangelo to come to examine his piece of work, his work of art, and critique it. Oh, no master have examined this more closely. And Michelangelo examined the, the carving of this uh, angel. And then he just said one thing. It is wonderful, but it lacks only one thing. It is wonderful, perfect, flawless. It is wonderful, but it lacks only one thing. And Michelangelo never said what this one thing was. He just left. And the young artist was distraught. He couldn't sleep. He lost sleep. It was like this was his masterpiece. And the great Michelangelo says one thing is missing. What is the missing thing? Is, is, is there something that he did not do for this sculpture? So a friend went to Michelangelo and asked, you said one thing is missing. You didn't tell us what the one thing is. So what is missing? And Michelangelo says it lacks one thing. It lacks life. It lacks life. Now, put it from the art world, it means that it's a flawless piece of marble uh, and a wonderful sculpture, but it doesn't come across alive. That is from the art world. But, but as a metaphor of life, dead statues cannot give life. Dead crosses cannot give life. Besides the cross of Jesus, there are literally tens of thousands of crosses that was used in the Roman Empire as means of execution. None of these gave life. The reason why the cross of Jesus is life-giving is because Jesus, the Son of God, hung on the cross and laid down His life for our life. And because He was the perfect sacrifice, the Son of God, He stared down death and won victorious over death that he might give to us life. That's why he said in John 10, 10, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now you notice the Bible never tells us that we will have an abundant life. It says more specifically, you will have life more abundantly. There's a huge difference between an abundant life and life more abundantly. What's the difference? An abundant life is punctilia. In other words, point in time. An abundant life is something you can accomplish, you can attain, you can get, you can obtain and say, I have the abundant life. Jesus is saying, I give you life and I give you life more abundantly. There is no arrival point. At every season of your life, there is the mystery of God, the presence of God, the glory and the joy of God, superintending your pilgrimage, superintending your journey. Every day you wake up with a new sense of the glory of God, a new wonder, a new joy that is yours because of the cross of Jesus. Life. How is it that many Christians don't live that life, don't sense that life? How is it that for many Christians, our existence is so tame, so lame, so same? Why? 
because we miss the thrill of following Jesus. That's why. We miss the thrill of knowing Him, loving Him, serving Him, and growing more and more like Him so that day by day we live in revival. Day by day, life is lived not just abundantly, but more abundantly. And in every season, the glory of God doesn't cease. It grows on us. We every season, it doesn't go still. The life more abundantly brings that sense of joy and wonder of the fantastic grace of God. That's the kind of life the cross offers to us. So when I say the irony of the cross is this instrument of death brings life, it's not mundane life, it's not mere existence, it's not boring life. What I mean by the instrument of death bringing life to us is life more abundantly. And God calls us to this life the reason why we are not excited about the Christian faith is because we have not touched this life. And a huge part of the reason why we have not understood or touched or lived this life is because we hold on to the illusion of control and we are afraid to surrender. We hold on to an illusion of control. I want to be in control of my life. I want to be in control of my finances. I want to be in control of my stuff. And because of the fear of letting go, we never really find the joy of walking in the life of God. My dear friends, God doesn't want to shortchange us. He really, really wants to bless us. Please, Walk in His blessing. Please understand the life that is His. Because He chooses to bless us. He doesn't want to shortchange us. I know you cannot outgive God. I give and give and give and still find I cannot outgive Him. He still bless and bless and bless. And I give and I still find myself being blessed. Don't walk with the sense of fear, but faith that our loving Father really wants to bless us. He does. He does. One day the Lord laid upon my heart, Son, I live in the north part of Singapore, Woodlands. The traffic congestion is really bad. We get stuck in our, our traffic for one hour, one and a half hours. To cut long story short, the Lord laid upon my heart, it's time to move out of Woodlands to, to a more convenient place where there are lesser traffic jams and the, I'm, I'm getting old, meaning the older I get, the more precious time is. I don't want to just get stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, those of you who know Pastor Rick Seward, Pastor Rick Seward was my neighbour. He's in the sixth floor, I'm on the 12th floor, same block. He moved out of Woodlands and said, that's the best decision he has made. Then he turns to me and says, Edmund, when are you moving out? I say, in the Lord's time. The Lord laid upon my heart, it's time to move out. So I asked Anne, Anne, look for me because we have a three-tier family, okay? Um, my parents are with me. My mother-in-law is staying with me. Anne is a superwoman. She has in our house two mother-in-laws, my mother and hers. So three old folks, two of my, my daughters, and then two of us and one dog. So I said, uh, Anne, help me look for a public housing that has four rooms and preferably three toilets, Okay? Four room, three toilets, so that there's peace on earth and goodwill to men. <laughs> we, went to, we went to Dover, down south, less congestion, uh, nearer the city, but off the fringe of the city. We went to Dover and, and found the prize and shook hands. You see, I live in a jumbo flat, as they call it. In other words, it's two flat joined to one because it's a three-tier family. And we bought it at a bargain. I, I tell young couples, don't grab, allow God to give. In other words, you receive, don't grab. We were not grabbing this Woodlands flat. It was literally handed over to us because the price was $100,000 less than market value. How do you get a price in Singapore, $100,000 $100, less than market value? Somebody committed suicide in the house. Nobody wants to buy. They consider it haunted. That kind of haunted houses, best for senior pastors. 
bought it, went in, prayed the presence of Jesus. It was wonderful until the Lord said, it's time to move out. And, and so I, the Lord said, I will provide. So we looked for a place. We went, shook hands. And then the sister didn't want to sell. Why? Sister Corner, for some reason, she said uh, she didn't want to sell. We said, never mind, it's all right. You know, uh, that means we are free to look for another place, yes. So we went to look for another place and then it was a quite a nice place. Four rooms, three bathrooms, great for our family. And we were about to shake hands. The f- guy called his wife. His wife doesn't want to sell. So I asked the Lord why. And the Lord said, don't worry, I have something better for you. Because if the Lord ever say, you know, stop looking, be contented, I am contented. The Lord don't have to tell me to be contented. I'm happy. I'm going nowhere. It's just that he's, I sense it's leading me out. He says he's provided, but this door's closed. The, the next house we went to, the housing agent didn't want to sell. <laughs> Why would housing agent not want to sell? Because the housing agent wants to represent both sides. In Singapore law, you cannot represent the seller and the buyer. It's against the law. But he pulled me out, not just out of the house, he pulled me down the lift and at the bottom of the flat asked me, do you have anyone selling? I want to represent you. I said, I already have somebody, can't. So he knew he couldn't represent both and get commission. Went to the owner and said some lies. The owner didn't want to see us, didn't want to sell. So in that sense, the agent didn't want to sell. So I asked the Lord, Lord, now what? He led us to Bedok in the east. So we went to Bedok. And it was wonderful. Four rooms, three bedrooms, price we can afford. Four toilets, sorry. Four, four bedrooms. Okay. Four toilets. So end love. Multiple toilets, more peace. But after we're about to buy, the son didn't want to sell. Yeah, the son actually said, but me, I have second thoughts, you know. Uh, maybe I thought of buying. And I said, it's good for you as a son to buy it. Keep it for yourself. We went out and, and strangely, the peace of God is still there. I asked the Lord, Lord, all these strange things happening, what are you saying? All the HDB, public housing, close, 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 in the most tremendous, dramatic circumstance. Lord, what are you saying? And the Lord told me very specifically, son, I have something better for you. We drove by a condominium and I jokingly said to Anne, Anne, I tell you what, we buy this. We can't afford a condominium, not in Singapore. I <laughs> jokingly say, okay, we buy this. We all laughed because it's a joke. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, son, do your sums. Do your sums. So in obedience, I said to Anne, Anne, can you find out how much this condo is and then find out in all our savings and whatever we have, la, put it together, tell us, tell me how much we have. She went to ask, it wasn't suitable for us because there's only three rooms. We needed four for our extended family. But the agent said there's a new development in a better location next to an MRT and cheaper. Would you be interested to see? And went to see, we did our sums and then we found that we were $20,000 short of the deposit. Now, I'm the kind I teach in discipleship, don't grab. If it's yours, it's yours. If it's not yours, don't grab. $20,000 short. I have good friends who I can go to and say, can I have a loan, a bridging loan of $20,000? I know them. They will say, what loan? Take this as a love gift from us. But we decided to tell nobody about it. We decided to ask for no loans. If we can afford, we could. If not, it's not of the Lord. We prayed. Within two weeks, a check came from an insurance uh, that M bought when I was young. It matured and it bridges the entire deposit. We went, did our sums again and discovered if we take this loan plus this, we're able to do this. Came to the Lord and prayed, Lord, what do we do? And I heard the Lord say, I have provided something better. This is for you. So the morning before we went to sign for the condominium, we did all our plans again, our due diligence, our financial check, everything, all checked out perfectly. So went to sign. But here's the problem. Our flat wasn't sold. In Singapore, you don't sign for condo or sign for buying of a flat when you can't sell. But the Lord was very clear. This I provided for you. So we step up by faith. Our house haven't sold. To cut long story short, we signed by faith. And then waited for the house to sell, right? 56 people went to see our house in Woodlands. No offer. Finally, 
there was one offer for seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars. All I wanted was seven hundred and fifty thousand in doing our sums. Seven hundred eighty. We thank the Lord. We we went sit down about to sign. The sister don't want to sign. The sister said, "I have second thoughts." I say, "It's all right." Again, the lesson of faith: don't grab. So we came and trust the Lord, and and then they left, and we and and I prayed in the bedroom. We said, "Thank you, Lord. We passed the test. We did not reduce. We did not say we only wanted seven hundred fifty thousand. We didn't. What we simply did was, we kept at the price seven hundred eighty. Walked by faith, and to cut long story short, in less than two weeks." There was an offer for eight hundred thousand signed, sealed, delivered, and so we came and see the Lord providing for us over and over again. But now we have a problem: eight hundred thousand on one condition: you release the flag, the the flag one month early. The condo, not finished building yet. So now we 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 say yes by faith. Now we pray that the condo will be ready, and that the flag will be sold. Condo was ready, flat was sold, but here's the problem: renovation. If not, how do we move in? It's a long story. I'll cut the long story short for you. We prayed for the right contractor, and as I at what entered the contractor's office, she said, "The owner of this office, ah,、uh, this this company, Pastor Chan. Now it embarrasses me, but there's a word. I am your fan club. I read your books. I see your tapes. I want to serve you. I promise you, I will deliver on time the renovation." And she did. Every step of the way, I saw the Lord providing. I will give you life, and I will give you life more abundantly. And please listen carefully. This life abundantly is not just money. This life abundantly is not just cars and condo. It is the step of faith of knowing my Father provides for me because He loves me. It's the joy, the thrill of walking with Jesus. Here's the third and last irony of the cross. The offer of the cross is free, but is so often rejected. The first irony: they crucify him as king when he, they mock him as king when he's in fact king. The second is that it was an instrument of death, but in in fact brought life. The third irony: the offer of the cross is free for everyone, but it is so often rejected. Look at verse forty-four as I come towards a close. Verse forty-four says, "And the robbers were crucified, who were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way." Two thieves, two robbers were beside Jesus, and we are told the story. One was hardened heart, one repented, and Jesus said, "Today you'll be me in paradise." But before the one repented, they both mocked Jesus. The Bible says they both reviled him, they both rejected him, they both walked in doubt. The gospel is given free, and yet the pride of fallen humanity will reject the free gift of God in the gospel. Until one of them was convicted, and then he says, "Lord, remember me, remember me as you when you enter your Father's kingdom." And Jesus said, "Today you will be with me in paradise." Unnamed men representing the whole of humanity. One continued in unbelief; the other was started in unbelief, but came to the saving faith that is in Jesus. My dear friends, here's my word for you as I come to a close: Don't lose heart. We may have loved ones and friends who don't know Jesus, but don't lose heart. Persevere to share with them the gospel of Jesus. Persevere to tell them Jesus gave us life and life more abundantly, not quantitatively but qualitatively. He comes to change our life. He comes to give newness of life. Persevere on in sharing the gospel with them, because you never know. One day, just like the thief, the robber who reviled Jesus, one day, his heart was turned around, and he accepted Jesus into his life. My mother-in-law, my grandmother-in-law did the same, and so I want to encourage you as you go on in your journey. Understand the power of the cross to change lives, because this is at the heart of discipleship. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Oh, Holy Father, help us to open our eyes to Jesus, 
to the cross of Christ and understand the power of the cross. And help us therefore, Lord, with the joy of the newness of life, the fullness of life, and life more abundantly, that we might be thrilled with the relationship we have with Jesus. To follow Him in true discipleship, in a grand adventure of faith, to know He provides for us, He loves us, He gives us not just life, but life more abundantly. And help us to testify to the glory of the cross in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you for this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.